Egypt, I promise I won't call on you. Welcome everybody to Better Access, Better Care, a community meeting that's been sponsored by the Department of Health and Wellness in partnership with Health PEI. My name is Carol Gabbana. I'm with a private consulting firm in Charlottetown and I'm the MC for tonight. And I'm delighted to have been able to drive up to Alberton from Charlottetown because it was only when I got here this evening that I found the sun. So thank you for making sure that it was here. So this evening, we're going to start with a presentation from uh, Minister Doug Curry, the Minister of Health and Wellness. And following that, we'll have a presentation by uh, Dr. Richard Wedge, who is the interim CEO of Health PEI. They have lots of information to give you tonight, and Dr. Wedge will be using a slide presentation. And following that, there will be opportunity for lots of questions. So we invited people to come tonight uh, starting at 7 and we'll be finishing at 9. After the presentations, I'll come back and g give you a few tips and suggestions about the questions. And so without any further ado, I'd like to uh, have you help me welcome Minister of Health and Wellness, Minister Doug Curry. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Alberton, and certainly want to acknowledge, I do have some colleagues uh, here in the, the room this evening. We've got, uh, obviously, MLA Pat Murphy from the area, Paula Bigger, um, Minister Rob Henderson, Minister Sheridan. I see uh, the leader of the ND party, Mike Redman, is with us tonight. I see the leader of the opposition, uh, Steve Myers. Um, Hal Perry is here tonight as well. I uh, want to acknowledge, uh, I don't think I've, oh, uh, I think I've got everybody as far as uh, elected. Anybody who would I miss? Sunny Glance, yes, Sunny. I didn't see Sunny come in, so. I um, also would certainly like to acknowledge uh, all the staff from, from Health PEI uh, who, who are here and uh, certainly the great work that they do across our, our communities in Prince Edward Island. And uh, we're pretty fortunate to have uh, the dedicated professionals that we do have. Certainly also want to acknowledge uh, uh, some board members here tonight uh, Dr. Donna Murnahan, who's the chair of Health PEI, Phyllis Horn from Alberton is a board member, Jim Revel from Charlottetown, another board member, and Rhonda Smallman, uh, who is from O'Leary, that is another board member. So certainly welcome uh, all of you, and certainly most importantly, it's great to see a great turnout here in the community. And uh, one thing I've learned, uh, uh, as I think that I'm the longest standing health minister in the country now, that anytime you want to talk about health care, you can really get uh, a lot of attention, and certainly, uh, one thing here in Prince Rhode Island, healthcare is a very, very important uh, piece to our communities and it's a very important part of what we're all about as Islanders. And uh, certainly uh, as the minister, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to be the minister in the portfolio now for the majority of my uh, political career. So I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of uh, community leaders, healthcare providers, had an opportunity to really get some, uh, some real insight into the roots of healthcare and communities across Prince Edward Island and really where, where healthcare has been in this province and where we continue to evolve to. So certainly I want to acknowledge the constituents uh, who are here tonight that rely on uh, the Alberton Hospital for, for services and uh, other communities that, uh, that uh, fall into the catchment area of this uh, community as well. So certainly want to acknowledge that. And I also had the opportunity, um, we were in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, obviously touring uh, this one of the collaborative emergency room centers, which are become very popular in Nova Scotia. I believe they've opened up their seventh, eighth facility and are being modeled in Saskatchewan as well. And it's a model that we're going to introduce here tonight and share with you. We had an opportunity to go, uh, the, the local MLA, Pat Murphy, was with us. We also had some community leaders and I believe some uh, nurses that worked in the Western facility joined us. So it was a great day, it was a real uh, interesting experience to see uh, innovative models of service delivery that other communities uh, in comparable sizes are uh, implementing uh, that are facing some of the same challenges here, uh, um, you know, in this region, very similar to some of the challenges that we're facing here in the province of Prince Edward Island. So certainly I, uh, I enjoyed that. Um, in respect to uh, some of the, some of the a couple of things that I want to just comment on tonight is that I don't have a script and I'm not going to read from script and 
Some of the, um, the, the trends that our province is facing here in Prince Rhode Island, that's trends that are no different than Charlottetown to Alberton to Tignish to Surrey. We've got two trends and two realities facing the province of Prince Rhode Island. One is we've got an aging population. Our baby boomers, which were brought into this, this country between 1945 and 1965, are now turning uh, between the ages of 50 and 70 and moving through our, our system. And obviously, if you look at the system and you look at the expansion of services, if you look at the volume of healthcare providers, you look at the growth of budgets, uh, there's, a, there's a correlation between the age of our population and the pressure that our, uh, our system is experiencing through that. So certainly, uh, our aging population um, is a reality. Uh, one in five uh, people in our population will be over 65 by the time 2020 uh, arrives on our, our doorstep. And also the number of people uh, living with uh, a level of chronic disease here in the province of Prince Edward Island. And chronic disease, if you look at the Chief Public Health Officer's report, which presented to Islanders uh, last uh, February, it shows some alarming statistics in respect to some of the challenges that we're facing as we try to manage uh, um, chronic disease uh, and try to basically keep people out of uh, acute care facilities here in Prince Edward Island. So those are two real pressures. Uh, that we're being faced with. When I came in uh, to this portfolio as minister in 2007, our provincial health care budget was $360 million. This fiscal, we are moving close to $570 million, which is about a $200, 000, $200 million increase in spending over uh, about a five-year period. We have more doctors today in our system than we ever have. We have more nurses, more LPNs, more RCWs. We've expanded the scope of practice um, with our advanced care paramedics, our LPNs. So we're trying to utilize all the resources we have in our, in our system to their full scope to make sure that we continue to provide uh, the best access to the best services that we possibly can provide. With that being said, as Minister, I've learned uh, in my journey that healthcare is a very personal issue. It's a very emotional issue. It's an issue that touches uh, the lives of us all, whether it's a, a neighbor, a parent, a family member. And uh, when you're the Minister of Healthcare, you really have the attention of approximately 146,000 uh, Islanders because it really crosses the lives of everybody uh, in this province. So my, uh, my job and my mandate as Minister is to look at healthcare from a provincial lens, but also to try to find the balance between healthcare in the province and what's important and what is um, uh, doable in communities across Prince Edward Island. Can I have my water right there, Jim? So the challenge for myself as Minister is to look at our healthcare system and we've got a province of 146,000 people. Um, we're spending uh, per average um, um, over the national average per islander on healthcare here in the province of Prince Edward Island. So basically one of the things that I, I see here in the province is I see assets and I see assets in our community hospitals. We've got five community hospitals as you know, we've got uh, the Prince County Hospital, we've got the QEH which is our two larger 24-7 uh, referral facilities. We also have our provincial addiction facility in Mount Herbert and we also have our acute mental uh, hospital in Hillsboro. So we've got uh, nine facilities that provide health care service for Islanders every day. Today, at the Prince County Hospital and the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, we're providing services to approximately 1,000 Islanders in those two facilities from tip to tip all across the province. I see our community hos hospitals as being assets, but it also at the same time as Minister, I see the challenge, how do we continue to evolve our system forward to respond to the demands and the pressures that we're currently under? And that's a challenge, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real issue uh, for myself. We continue to look at ways that we can uh, provide better access and expand the, the opportunities for better care. So certainly um, it's, a, it's a challenge and one of the things we rolled out last, uh, last spring in the Speech from the Throne, you know, after looking at uh, the investments we made in healthcare providers and operational spending and the money we spent on infrastructure, uh, across the province, uh, we shifted our focus back to the patient. And we felt, I felt as minister that uh, with the investments we were making, we, we really have shifted away from, from the patient uh, here in the province of Prince Edward Island. So we set five key areas for patient access. 
One obviously was better access to physicians, better access to long-term care, better access to elective surgeries because here in the province, I think we're performing last in the country uh, in areas of elective surgery, particularly in hips and knees. We're performing well with cataract surgery and radiation therapy, but that's one particular area that we're not performing very well. And with that being said, we've increased the number of procedures that we've provided here in the province to islanders, but at the same time with the demographics and the population, we're, we're falling behind. We've also made it a commitment to expand and to look at ways for better access for emergency room services and of course, and last but not least, uh, addictions and mental health access. And we'll be rolling out our, uh, our, our plan and our report uh, this spring uh, to Islanders to look at ways that we can continue to improve access and ways that we can be better served in the whole area of mental health and addictions. So here in the province of Prince Edward Island, um, if you look at publicly funded Medicare, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but publicly funded Medicare is something that separates this country from the rest of countries around the world. It's free, and we as a province, we have a $570 million budget. We also have uh, included in that $570 million, we've got a $50 million budget. Basically, we have, a, we have a healthcare facility outside the province. Any given year, we've got approximately 25,000 islanders that are requiring services outside the province of Prince Royal Island for some type of care. That could be at the QE2, that could be uh, at the IWK, that could be in surgery services, in, uh, particularly in cardi cardiac uh, care at the St. John Hospital, or uh, types of uh, neurosurgery that are uh, held in, uh, in Moncton. So we ba basically, uh, we don't do all services here in the province of Prince Royal Island, but we do have an outer province budget and uh, provide services to Islanders when they need them uh, outside uh, the, uh, the community. So, with that being said, uh, tonight really is an opportunity for you to have your voice and to ask questions. Um, to, I'm here to listen. I'm here to provide information back to you. I do have some staff here that can support us on some of the technical. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a doctor. But uh, I have been around uh, this responsibility for some time. And uh, I know the file reasonably well, but I don't have all the answers. So we're here tonight to listen to your concerns, to your fears to your uncertainties and to address those. Dr. Wedge will uh, come up shortly and give you a high level overview of our healthcare system here. And I truly believe and I strongly believe that we have a lot of assets here in the province, a lot of, a lot of uh, assets that I think can make our healthcare system uh, very unique. And obviously the work that we're doing here in the province of Prince Edward Island is being monitored and watched by other jurisdictions. And we continue to uh, invest in health care, but I also recognize that health care has to continue to evolve and will continue to evolve, whether I'm the minister standing in front of you or I'm part of a government that's in front of you. And if you look at the changes over the last 10 years, emergency rooms uh, by, uh, by governments have been closed. Things are evolving. We're putting more of a shift into home care, or primary care. And it really ties back into the two trends that we're being faced with here in the province of Prince Royal Island. That's our aging population and the high volumes of chronic disease tied in with our aging population as well. So we've got some challenges, but it's important for me to be in the communities, and this is the second of seven community meetings that I'll be uh, into, and uh, I'm sure I'll uh, get uh, a lot of uh, feedback and uh, a lot of good questions uh, from uh, communities across Prince Royal Island, and I certainly uh, I look forward to that. So with that being said, I want to thank you for being here. I'll pass the, uh, the uh, mic off to Dr. Wedge, the uh, interim CEO for Health PEI, and he'll walk you through a presentation, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Minister. So I have a, a series of slides to go through just to kind of outline how uh, Health PEI is going to uh, implement the government's uh, new direction in the provincial health plan. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, some of the staff that are along the side uh, who have a number of posters around uh, long-term care, extended care, primary care, and emergency care. So uh, hopefully after the meeting, people will be able to go by and, and see what sort of services are being offered with various, with various services. <coughs> so as the minister said, uh, we have a number of uh, facilities on PEI, or, or eight hospital uh, facilities throughout the, uh, throughout the island, as well as about 35 other uh, clinic facilities that we operate across PEI and we, 
we find all of them are, are of some value in, in different areas to, for different services across the island. Uh, people may have seen this uh, particular ad, so I won't go into it uh, in, in much detail, but it's been in the paper uh, basically outlining the, the types of facilities that we're talking about tonight, acute care facilities, extended care facilities, as well as uh, services such as home care and uh, primary care. So there's a lot of confusion out there about what exactly is uh, acute care, what is extended care. Acute care we're looking at is people who are, have fairly severe uh, illnesses. Most of them do require the service of a specialist um, and most of that uh, care is provided through an emergency room and then admission to a, to a hospital. But uh, right now acute care uh, does occur in a number of other hospitals including Surrey and O'Leary. Extended care is another one that's been very confusing uh, in the media. People are looking at extended care as if it's a, a manor, but extended care is not manor care. I want to make, uh, make sure everybody understands that. With extended care, people still need the services of a hospital. They still need 24-hour nursing. They still need the services of a physician to come by once or twice a day to supervise that care. So that's, um, it, it's not a manor care. A manor is obviously a, a, a home where people who are no longer live, uh, able to live independently in their own home. Extended care is different. So we're looking at restorative care for people that are recovering post-stroke. Uh, post we're looking at convalescent care for people that are, have mobility problems uh, following surgery or perhaps uh, have a post-op infection. We're looking at palliative care for people at the end of life uh, for their care. We're looking at uh, respite care for families to be able to uh, look after people at home and have some, some break if they need to take a few weeks off. So as the, uh, the minister is saying, essentially this is the, uh, the, new, uh, the new direction we're going in, uh, in terms of, uh, of hospital care. Stuart Memorial Hospital uh, being converted into a long-term care facility of 23 beds. The uh, community hospital in Larry as well as uh, Surrey to, uh, to specialize in extended care. The Western Hospital and Kings County Memorial Hospital will continue to provide primary acute care and the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and the Prince County Hospital in Summerside will continue to provide specialized uh, acute care. This is a, uh, a bit of a, a schematic diagram to try and indicate to people where acute care is currently happening in West Prince. As you can see, the, uh, the, green, um, the green, the purple, and the blue is essentially uh, Prince County Hospital, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and Western Hospital. The orange and the red are uh, care that is occurring at Stuart Memorial and O'Leary Hospital. So about 86% of acute care is now happening in um, Western Hospital, Prince County Hospital mainly, but also some people at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, this is just some indication of uh, of people that are uh, at the Prince County Hospital and Queen Elizabeth Hospital every day uh, being admitted to hospital needing specialized care but don't have a bed to be put in so they actually receive their care in the emergency room of Prince County Hospital and the Queen Elizabeth. So as you can see there's roughly 12 people a day that are in the emergency department of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital receiving care and about two to three people a day in the Prince County Hospital receiving care. And this is one of the reasons why they have to receive care in the, in the, in the emergency department. These are uh, people in Queen Elizabeth Hospital as well as the Prince County Hospital who have finished their acute stay and yet have no place to go and so they are occupying an acute care bed. So as you can see the blue bars being Queen Elizabeth Hospital, roughly 12 people a day, uh, 12 people, uh, roughly 25 people a day are in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital but don't actually need the care of uh, the uh, medical team at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and about 11 people a day are in the Prince County Hospital and could be moved somewhere else. So obviously if they were moved to a, a different facility that could care for them in an appropriate manner with the right staff, the people wouldn't be in the emergency department uh, receiving care. So this is a similar uh, graph around uh, both West, Western Hospital and the uh, community hospital O'Leary. Um, 
with the number of people that are receiving alternate care there. As you can see by the numbers, the, the majority of people in both those hospitals actually are, are alternate level of care currently. Uh, this is an occupancy rate of the hospitals. It's obviously uh, fairly full, run, running from about 75 to 95 percent uh, occupancy most of the times, but that does mean that there are two or three beds uh, empty on any given day. And uh, our hope is that as we start moving patients into those beds and receiving some of the care, that the occupancy will actually uh, increase in, in Western PEI. Some of the other uh, changes uh, that were announced uh, is a new interfacility transfer unit. And this is a, an ambulance that's equipped, but it's not part of the emergency ambulance system. This uh, ambulance will move patients on scheduled appointments between hospitals so that the emergency ambulance isn't called out of, uh, out of the rotation and is available for 911 calls. There are also going to be two rapid response units. These are uh, basically SUVs that are uh, equipped with a paramedic and they will uh, respond to 911 calls if the ambulance is going to be delayed and they will start the treatment when they arrive and then when the ambulance arrives they will uh, take over the treatment. So these people will allow, will allow patients to be treen, uh, treated sooner uh, after a 911 call in both West Prince and Kings County. Um, this is just to give everybody a, a rough idea where the uh, ambulances are currently located. There are bases, of course, in uh, O'Leary and Alberton. We do uh, have a, a, a staging base in the Mount Pleasant Bloomfield area, as well as up in the Tignish area, and occasionally down in Tyne Valley, Richmond area. And this is usually when a, a couple of the ambulances are, are out on calls. They try and spread them out in order to be able to make a faster response in West Prince. There's been a lot in the media about uh, wait times at Prince County Hospital. Uh, this is a slide to show that, that basically the, the blue lines are the people that are there for what we call true emergencies, people who are unconscious, people who are severely short of breath, severe chest pain, uh, prolonged seizures, those sort of true emergencies. And the uh, red lines are the um, patients who are there that could be seen in a family doctor's office. But in fairness, a lot of times this is after hours or weekends or holiday time that's, that's there. So as you can see, the, uh, it's about 90 minutes uh, response time uh, between the time they arrive at the hospital and, and a doctor sees them for true emergencies and about two hours and, and a bit for the, uh, for the non. So that's, uh, that's the, the monthly stats for Prince County Hospital. Uh, Western Hospital, uh, is, these are the monthly stats for there. They, they obviously are, are doing a bit better with about 30 to 40 minute response time for true emergencies and about uh, an hour or so for, for the family doctor visits. Here's a, uh, a stats around, around emergency department visits. As you can see, Roughly 7 o'clock in the morning, people start arriving at the Western Hospital when the physician arrives for 8 o'clock. During the day is when the bulk of the patients come in, and around 6 o'clock, the, the number of visits starts to taper off fairly quickly. Obviously, uh, overnight, there's, there's very few visits to the emergency department at Western Hospital. That's another um, uh, slide around... Uh, point okay. So the um, these are five levels of emergency. The, the levels one, two, and three, which are true emergencies. You can see that these are make up the smaller number at Western Hospital. The level fours, which are family doctor visits, are the bulk of the visits at Western Hospital. And then, of course, there are some what we would call elective visits. These are people who uh, presumably don't have a family doctor or they need a prescription refill, but they're coming and using the emergency room for that. We are going to put these slides on the web uh, in case people want to go over them in more detail. So, um, the, as the minister was saying, the, the plan is to have a, a collaborative emergency center based out of the Western Hospital. And with that, the physician will be available just as it is now, as the physician is now from 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night, alongside an emergency department nurse, the same as it is now. But at 8 o'clock, uh, the staffing would change to a a, a different mix. It could be one of a number of different mixes, uh, an RN-RN model or an RN paramedic model similar to what goes on in Nova Scotia. 
and these uh, two health professionals will be available for the, uh, from 8 p.m. at night till 8 in the morning uh, for anybody that comes in with a health concern and they will help them sort through that concern, whether it's uh, help them into an emergency uh, vehicle to transfer to Prince County Hospital, or whether it's to um, um, provide some treatment for them uh, that night to come back and see the doctor the next day, or actually provide treatment and they don't need to come back, depending on the situation. Um, the final initiative uh, announced was an 811 telehealth uh, a uh, line that people can call 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, and speak to a, uh, a nurse at the other end and kind of work through whatever that health concern may be and uh, try and get some advice. So that'll be available in multiple languages as well. So there's been uh, a few examples either by uh, email or through uh, people phoning into our, our offices, some letters to the editor. You know, for example, uh, one is a 94-year-old uh, female that was sent home at midnight because there was no bed available to Prince County Hospital. On four occasions over the next four months, uh, she spent some time on a stretcher in the emergency room, never did actually get admitted to the hospital for care. These are the sort of things we're trying to avoid by, by making some changes to the healthcare system. It's not a good way to treat a 94-year-old lady by sending her home uh, at midnight, obviously, when she, she's uh, gone to the hospital for care. Another one is an adult male who fell from a ladder and broke his upper arm, uh, waited in hospital from Saturday until Wednesday before they were transferred to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. This is another West Prince uh, resident as well. Transferred to the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital for definitive care in a, in a plate put in his arm five days later because there was no bed available at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital to admit him. That's, another, that's obviously another example of uh, things that we want to try and improve in the healthcare system. So this slide um, tells us basically what's uh, happening now within the system. The patient uh, tends to go to the hospital, the emergency room, it, it, things go reasonably well between the hospital and the emergency room. They get admitted to the floor, there tends to be a bit of a blockage there because there's not always a bed available. There's not always uh, discharged at the appropriate time, so there's a blockage there. Sometimes there's not home care, sometimes they go direct to home, sometimes they uh, go to long-term care, but they tend to stay uh, on the medical floor for a period of time because there's no bed available in long-term care. And because of that, of course, it interferes with people's ability to get into the hospital for elective surgery as well. So once they have their surgery, it does tend to flow fairly well to discharge for most patients. So this one is the, uh, the new plan that we want people to be able to go to the hospital, be seen quickly in the emergency department, admitted if uh, necessary to a medical floor and discharged appropriately. We need people to come into the hospital, go for elective surgery and discharge appropriately as well. And we want to make, be able to make sure that they can go to uh, either to home, to an extended care hospital, to long-term care, um, and then receive their treatment. So in summary, uh, for Western Hospital, because we're here in the Alberton area, we wanted to reiterate that the lab and x-ray services are going to remain uh, at the Western Hospital, that it will become the acute care center for West Prince. There will be a rapid response unit in the area. The emergency department service will have a physician available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and a collaborative emergency center from 8 uh, p.m. to 8 a.m. There'll be improved uh, access to primary care because the physicians now who work the overnight shift aren't working the next day in their office, so they're not available to see patients. And there'll be an 811 telehealth uh, number available. Um, just a reminder of some folks about primary care in West Prince. Um, I'm not sure if everybody is aware, but um, PEI has been divided into five primary care networks, so West Prince, East Prince, there are two in the Queens County area and one in the Kings County area. So the West Prince uh, Primary Care Network, we anticipate there will be about 7,500 more primary care uh, appointments uh, available to, to patients to be able to see the doctors in their office in West Prince. Um, we're currently recruiting two nurse practitioners to the West Prince area and hopefully will happen this summer. And then we have a number of uh, enhanced chronic disease um, management strategies in place for uh, lung disease, uh, people with blood thinners, diabetes, and uh, mental health issues. And we've uh, set up outreach programs in Tignish and Lenox Island. 
So in summary, that's uh, some of the service improvements that we uh, hope to take effect over the next few months. And um, we're going to be listening to, uh, to what the people of West Prince think of, think of those changes. So I'm going to leave that uh, summary slide up there too, just in case people uh, have some questions about it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wedge. Well, now it's time for the minister and for Dr. Wedge to hear your questions. And um, I'm going to ask you to come to the microphone here at the front, right in the middle. And if you can't, then I have a microphone and I can take the mic to you. So you just need to wave at me. Um, I'd ask you when you come up to, to ask a question that you would say your name so we know who you are. And um, as the minister indicated, he and Dr. Wedge are both prepared to answer your questions, as well as other health PEI staff who are here, if there's a question that's beyond their expertise. Um, as, as the minister uh, noted right at the beginning, uh, health and health care are a really important issue to all islanders. And my experience would say that sometimes when we talk about important issues, especially like health care, emotions can run high. And I'm going to ask us, just to remind us all to be really respectful in our conversations tonight. And one of the ways that we can do that is just to take note if there are lots of people lined up to ask questions. So just kind of monitor how long you're at the microphone so that we can make sure that all the questions that we can answer tonight before 9 o'clock, that there is time for that. So I invite um, questions now, and please just come to the microphone at the front. Hi, my name is Natasha Dunn, and I am the chair of Save Western Hospital ER, as well as a committee member of Island-wide Hospital Access. I'd like to welcome some of the folks who came here from Surrey tonight with the Island-wide Hospital Access Committee and committee reps from Tyne Valley and O'Leary here with us this evening. Thank you very much, folks, for coming out. <laughs> Minister Curry, I would like to thank you for coming to Alberton to deliver your government's plan for Western Hospital, but it's a little too late. Over 1,000 people in West Prince signed a petition to keep the ER open 24-7 with physician coverage. Your government failed its own people by implementing changes without community consultation. You have already made your decision. So, Minister Curry, why are you here now? Why not just put it in a press release like you already did? Are you here to pat our heads and say, they're there, everything's going to be okay? much like what was done in O'Leary. And then two weeks later, your government slashed services at O'Leary Hospital. <laughs> the Medical Society stated that in order for health care to be effective, there needs to be collaboration. And there was none. Dr. Reed preached an effective partnering as well. Well, where was the partnering with local community in rolling out changes to our health care? 66,000 out of 140,000 people who live on PEI are rural islanders. But less than 5% of the health budget is spent on rural hospitals. We realize that health care with an aging population is an expense on the taxpayer. But we are the taxpayers. And our taxes in rural PEI, they count too. We're tired of being treated as second-class citizens, and your new health care slogan, Better Access, Better Care, is a slap in the face for rural islanders. It's a, this is a two-tier level of health care, one for urban and one for rural islanders. The government knew last summer, and for years before this, that we needed doctors to staff our ER. So my question to you, Mr. Curry, is this. How can we attract doctors without our own local recruitment officer? 
this government slash the position up west? How can we have our own voice now without our own health board? Your government disbanded. So what have you done to keep this from happening? Your government made the statement that our ER would not be shut down as long as there were doctors to cover the shifts back in August. So what have you done since then to try to find doctors and recruit them to keep our ER open? What have you done? Well, I can answer, you for, I can answer that and the answer is nothing. Can you tell the good people of West Prince as to why Dr. Charles's billing number will not be replaced? That his number has been retired and now we'll, we will have even fewer doctors for West Prince. Doctors who want to do ER have been told not to. Makes it sound like the government is sabotaging its own system to make it fail. Sabotaging the health of its own people. Dr. Desmond Callahan's article today about the fi fictional grandmother who used an acute care bed instead of being sent to long-term care, well, we know this happens, but it's only going to get worse without a physician at Western. Patients who receive care in their own communities have much needed family support, and it's proven that driving for health care, such as dialysis, can be de detrimental to a patient's care. Dr. Wedge and Minister Curry have not guaranteed us the highest skill level of healthcare professional that will staff the CEC. And can these people admit to Western Hospital? Currently, there are five nurse practitioner openings on the island, and yet we're going to have to fill another two more? <coughs> so, Minister Curry, who actually makes these decisions? You or Health PEI? There's no use in complaining without offering a solution. So here is a solution to work towards keeping our ER open. Hire a local recruitment officer who's not appointed. Give the, people, give the power back to the people. Let us have our own local committee because we will do the work. Thank you very much. So it's my turn. Hello. Thank you very much, Natasha, and uh, certainly um, recruitment uh, to rural communities in this province is no different than it is in any other province in the country. And certainly as Minister, I, I recognize that there's a high level of frustration. We're certainly um, continue to look, and I don't have all the data to, and the, the evidence to look at the number of site visits. It's been a challenge to retain and stabilize uh, rural physicians since uh, 2002 and even earlier. When I came into the role as minister, uh, I still remember my first visit to Surrey was uh, because we were on the brink of losing uh, the last one and two of our physicians in that community. We were able to stabilize it. Since, uh, since uh, that time, we've, we've, we've had the opportunity to implement the residency program last year. Five of the graduating resident students that uh, are from all other province have chosen to stay here in the province of Prince Edward Island. We basically have a complement of 233 physicians today, more, more physicians uh, um, than we've ever had. But the challenge is, is that uh, we've put incentives on the table, we have rural recruitment initiatives. We recently rolled out before Christmas, we offered uh, uh, family residency students uh, a check basically for $110,000 for a five-year uh, commitment to uh, rural communities in Prince Edward Island. We have just presented that uh, initiative to uh, uh, med students and we're in conversations right now. I mean, we're looking at every, every opportunity to continue to stabilize <coughs> services, uh, particularly via physicians. And if you look at the CEC implementation in Spring Hill, very similar scenario to what we've experienced in, in uh, rural communities here. And basically, physicians are choosing to not work in emergency rooms. They're not trained emergency room physicians, and they are making the choice. They want to work in collaborative um, models of care. They want to work in primary care. Uh, they're making that choice. And when we start, I know uh, I'm in uh, ongoing discussions with recruitment. Uh, when we start getting into the discussion about uh, there's opportunities to work in emergency rooms, uh, physicians are choosing to steer away to other opportunities. Um, if you look at the model, the CEC model in Spring Hill uh, and other communities that it's been implemented in, um, the model is working and it's, it's a new model of service delivery. If you look at the volumes and the acuities that are, are coming into uh, the emergency rooms, um, 
doctors are, are, are choosing. If you look at Montague, the, the overnight, the physicians chose not to work in the emergency room based on the fact that there was no volume and no acuity. As a result of choosing not to work in the emergency room, it expanded the number of uh, physician appointment times during the day by over 7,000. So as much as um, I'd like to be able to, um, you know, I don't have the ability as the minister to force people into communities to work in physician positions. I mean, we have to find creative ways. They have to believe in the, in the model of and uh, the direction that we're moving the healthcare system. And I've had uh, uh, numerous conversations with uh, medical students and they are in the position right now that they make the choice of w where they go to work. So uh, that is part of the dilemma. We, uh, as the minister, uh, we, we work aggressively in recruitment to attract uh, to rural. Um, I think there's a lot of upsides uh, in our community hospitals. There's a lot of um, opportunities. But, you know, they, uh, and we continue to find uh, creative ways to try to attract them to uh, rural Prince Rhode Island. It's a challenge here and it's a challenge everywhere across uh, the country. And, we basically are looking at the role. We've expanded the scope of the nurse practitioner. We've got vacancies. We're, we're training nurse practitioners that are working in the system now that are working in facilities across Prince Rhode Island. So we're trying to uh, continue to uh, put health professionals into the system that can meet the demands and the needs. And I'm not in the position as the minister to force people to work in communities they don't want to work in. I just don't have that ability. And if you look at the, uh, the, the data and the numbers and the money we're spending on recruitment, we're, we're making investments. And it would be a whole lot easier if I had all the complements across Prince Rhode Island filled today in respect to the number. We've got a complement of 12 in the West. And if you look at Montague and Surrey, we have a complement of 12 there. And I think in the West, we have 11. We've got one vacancy. I think Dr. Navke is still on uh, paternity leave. Um, I believe down east we have uh, two, maybe three vacancies in, in the east, but uh, uh, that's, that's the numbers and we're committed to continuing to look at ways that we can continue to uh, stabilize uh, uh, physician services. There's been a high volume of uh, physicians in the west retire and uh, if you look at uh, the Dr. Zetties of the world, physicians uh, of the day don't work like they did. It's a different It's a different mindset and the new family position coming out is more interested in work-life balance than uh, high volumes of uh, patient loads. So it's a bit of a challenge, there's no question, but uh, certainly government has continued to be committed. The residency program will, has and will prove to be a, a, a positive investment. Any, um, I'll just answer because this mic is working here. But. People hear me? Okay. Um, just to kind of fill in, in terms of recruitment in, in the West Prince area, it is actually very important for community leaders to get involved in recruitment. Um, when site visits are here, they, they do um, go on tours of the area, they need to know about what's the advantages to working in the area, they need to work with all the physicians that are there, they need to have a, a the physicians have some consensus about what they need, need them to do and what their role are going to be in the community. So it is, it is very important for the community to get involved. And I know different community leaders have been involved in the past, so hopefully uh, you'll make contact with the, uh, with the recruitment office. I also want to talk about the uh, billing number issue with, with Dr. Doerr that you brought up. I'm not quite sure what, that, uh, what that's all about, but it's not correct. The billing numbers are different from position numbers. As the minister said, there are 12 positions available in West Prince, and there is, uh, there is a, a a position available. When physicians leave, their billing numbers go with them, but it's not retired, so it's not replaced. Does that make any sense? The billing number is not the same as a position. So there are 12 positions in West Prince, two in the Tyne Valley area, 10 in the more, the more traditional West Prince area. There is, as the minister says, one vacancy that's currently being recruited, but there are two people on personal leave right now. Thank you, Natasha, and I think there's like one, yeah. <laughs> I'm Helen McNeil. I'm with the West Prince Save the Ho Western Hospital and also on the island-wide access, hospital access committee. Um, Mr. Curry, back in January 2013, the 21st of January, I noticed that the job postings requiring doctors differed from one hospital to another. Uh, all read they must possess Canadian exams or equivalents and at least one to two 
clinical experience, uh, one to two years of clinical experience in Canada. But in Montague, it also read physicians who had full licensure in UK, USA, or South Africa are eligible to apply without Canadian exams. Then in Surrey, it read exception, UK, USA, Australia, and South Africa. But in West Prince, there were no exceptions. That same morning, I called Mr. Murphy and asked him why, and he said he would look into it. He called back and said, this is a mistake, and thanks for noticing it. By one o'clock, I checked the job postings again, and it had been changed in all red, one to two years experience in Canada, but no exceptions. But the posting for family physicians for radiation oncology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital did not ex mention experience, and still doesn't. There have been job, job posts, this has been job, these job postings have been posted since 2011. No wonder we can't get doctors to apply for West Prince. But it did prove one thing, by a simple phone call, things could be changed. Other provinces in Canada, job postings state no experience required. Mr. Henderson asked me why do people in West Prince think that they are so special? Well, with one to two year experience required for doctors, what is so special about PEI in comparison to the rest of Canada? We don't need brain surgeons for family physicians. Thank you. Just a response to that, I mean, I, I can't speak specifically about uh, the job postings, but uh, certainly as the minister, I've been working and we're working very um, consistently with the, the College of Physicians here in the province of Prince Ronald. They have the, uh, the, the authority and responsibility. I have no authority or responsibility. That is their, uh, their mandate and their responsibility under the, uh, their, their duties to look at uh, licensing, obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a licensing and an issue that they, they authorize whether physicians can practice here. I do have some concerns with the college uh, about their, um, their, their, the current uh, um, process. And I think there's certainly opportunities and we've had recent conversations as early as this morning with the college about how we can continue to uh, my attitude is a physician is a physician is a physician, whether you're in Nova Scotia or in New Brunswick or in Ontario or in British Columbia. As long as they meet the requirements, uh, um, and obviously from a regional perspective, we're having discussions. Um, I know that there is incidents where physicians uh, who got uh, licensed and were granted privileges in Nova Scotia applied here to the province and were denied license under the college. So we're certainly working very aggressively um, and I'm very interested in looking at uh, potential opportunities um, in ways that we can, uh, you know, get in line, I guess, with some of the l l licensing timelines uh, that other jurisdictions are implementing. Hello, my name is Nathan Bushy, and uh, I'm with the Island-Wide Hospital Access Committee in Surrey. And I have a question. We see a lot of support coming from the PEI Medical Society for the minister. We cannot understand how the PEI Medical Society can support, support your proposal without having seen the plan. Has PEI Medical Society seen a proposal for health care that has not been announced to the public? Um, I can't speak on behalf of the medical society, obviously, but but the uh, the changes that are here. I, I assume you're speaking to uh, the president's interview on CBC. Is that is that what you're talking about? It or yeah, not not in particular. No, uh, even before anything was really found out, when it was just an ad in the paper saying we're losing all of our services, the medical society was coming out and saying this was a great idea. And we're assuming that they must have seen some sort of data, some sort of plan that uh, we have not. Um, you know, since they're doctors and everything is based on medical evidence. Yeah. 
The, um, uh, certainly we did talk to the medical society as well as the, the nursing union, a number of people uh, the day of the announcement to kind of describe some of the changes that are there. But I'm not aware that the medical society uh, were involved in, the, in, in any advanced uh, discussions before it uh, was brought to the communities. Uh, I'm not aware of any. So, so, so they had the same amount of information that we did at the time? Well, I just, yeah. Nathan, I'll just jump in. Obviously, the Medical Society represents the voice of physicians across the province of Prince Edward Island. And uh, certainly, if you want to talk about elective surgeries and the daily cancellations because of the inability for uh, orthos or a range of surgeons, their inability to access uh, acute care beds because of the bed blockage. I mean, there's certainly, um, there's a high level of frustration, um, particularly in the two, two hospitals, the Prince County Hospital and uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, because, you know, our emergency rooms are backed up uh, because we've got seniors sitting in stretchers, friend there. They live in communities in all over the province of Prince Royal Island. They're not just from Charlottetown and Summerside. And uh, they can't access a bed because we've got uh, in individuals convalescing, restoring, uh, medically discharged seniors. Uh, where we've got nowhere to move them to. And really this model is really about uh, using our assets in communities, driving people out to communities to convalesce and for post-op recovery. Um, there's a high level of frustration by our orthos, by our surgeons, um, they're, 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 there's no question. So they're, they're looking for um, system enhancements, how they can utilize their resources and so they're not telling individuals that are driving in for an elective surgery uh, that tell, oh, sorry, today's canceled. There's probably three to four to five surgeries canceled daily as a result of the inability uh, for them to have access to a bed. So um, um, as I say, there's a thousand islanders from Tignish to Surrey that are accessing services at those two hospitals. So, you know, as the minister, um, I have to see it from a provincial lens and I do have to see it as, as equity and trying to make sure that we, that we use our assets uh, to their full potential here in the province. And, we, we haven't uh, slowed down spending or stopped spending, uh, we continue. The, the number that concerns me is the number of islanders that are being transported off the island every day, and I indicated uh, it's, it's, a, it's a $50 million budget now for Etta Province Services, and it just continues to ramp up. So we have to look at ways that we can, we haven't closed a bed, we haven't closed, uh, I mean, we, we have to use our assets and our resources. And it's, these, aren't, these aren't, aren't easy decisions, and I know they're emotional and they're issues, but as, you know, if we continue to do nothing, uh, we're going to be in a lot, we're going to have a lot of challenges uh, here in the province in respect to trying to manage and maintain services at the level that, that islanders expect them. So the past statements were made with no data from the, medical, from the medical society. No, um, I, my, I, I have a lot of respect for our physicians in the province. They're very, very bright, and they're all very well educated, and they know that they know uh, the challenges uh, in the two main referral hospitals, particularly the specialist areas, that there's, there needs to be better utilization. If you look at the average length of stay in the PCH and the QEH, you're looking at probably, you know, two days. There, it's sort of at the national average. If you look at the average length of stays in our, in our smaller facilities, uh, I think we're in around nine, nine and a half days. So it's just about utilizing those beds t to their full potential and, um, you know, there's a high level of frustration. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the data we had here on the slides, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. We we do have data for ALC patients. We do have data for our acute but care patients as well. Yeah. Yeah. So at, with what we call alternate level of care patients, there are about ten different categories of alternate level of care. So I think you're talking about alternate level of care awaiting long term care. Those are patients that are looking for a man or bed but don't have it? Yeah. You want to know how long they've been waiting in the hospital? No. Are they included in your nine? No. Days no. No. The minister's talking about acute care stays that are over the, length, the expected length of stay. Something else. Uh, you mentioned 
You mentioned 200 visit plus physicians. That's not include. That's not family physicians. No. That's everybody. We have right? uh, our total physician population is approximately our full is two. I think it's 233 is the exact number. Is our approved complement? I think we have approximately. 225 we have some vacancies in family medicine obviously in the rural areas and we've got a couple vacancies uh, in oncology we've just announced that we will be adding a seventh surgeon to uh, to, to the province uh, so I think those are the numbers that we're we're, we're dealing with okay something else when on the uh, stats that you put up there with the evenings um, after 6 p.m. that the graph falls quite low I think you better go over and sit over at Western Hospital in the evening, well into 11 o'clock at night, and you will see that it doesn't fall at 6 o'clock. It increases. That data, where's that data come from? Uh, that's accurate data. But it's, that's it's individual days or individual days. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true data. My name is Don Humphrey. I come from Surrey. I, can everybody hear me without the microphone? Yeah. All right. Let's do that to somebody else. Perfect. A few of us to support you, fellas. Um, well, we we all know that health is at, always on a dilemma because we can always do more people, more things for people things we can do now we couldn't do 20 years ago so we're always going to need more beds so my question is what is the sense of taking five acute care beds out of Surrey or so many acute care beds out of Alberton or, or Leary putting them into Charlottetown and then what are you going to do for the people who need acute care beds in O'Leary and Surrey? Send them to Charlottetown. And instead of getting into the hospital in one hour, they're going to wait six or eight hours in ER and then maybe on a stretcher and waiting for something in, in, uh, in Charlottetown or Prince County and uh, keeping their families on tender hooks. So I don't see the math. It's a zero sum. But here is a suggestion if you need more beds. All those hospital beds, like in Surrey, went down from 22 to 17 active beds, and then were filled uh, with office workers, desk pilots, I call them. <laughs> why, not, why not reactivate those beds? And I'm sure there's more at Prince County and the hospitals up west. Just get rid of those pencil pushers and people who can't leave their desk without a piece of paper to make themselves look important, like they're doing something, and reactivate those beds. Why can't you do that? The, the total number of beds in the province is, is actually not there's not an increase in beds needed. We need to use the beds more appropriately. We need to admit people to the hospital more appropriately, and we need to get them out of the hospital in a timely manner so that they can return home. That's, that is the, actually the ultimate goal. It's not, it's not the number of beds. So adding more beds, you're right, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put more people in beds, but that's not getting to the point of, of making sure they're, they're in the hospital appropriately and they go home at the appropriate time. That kind of was part of my question. I, I'm actually the lady that two of the stats up there about the grandmother that was four times admitted into Prince County, sat for hours on an emergency bed. I also was the proclaimed husband that broke his arm and spent six days in Prince County Hospital because I refused for a doctor to send me home that night with a morphine tablet. Now, I should have probably went out and got a bat and said, here, use this, because that's the amount of care that you're considering right now. In saying that, I don't proclaim to be an accountant, but I did find out in that time period there were several people waiting for surgeries. And yes, that is a big issue. But I did find out there's 100 people at that time occupying beds waiting for long-term care facilities. 
I'm sitting here knowing full knowledge a facility was built in this brand new long-term care facility in Alberton, another one in Summerside, with not one extra bed, let alone take a chapel away from a manor here. When people are dying, it, when I found out the math, and I said, okay, well, maybe there wasn't money to build extra bigger buildings. When you talk a $1,250 stay per day in a hospital bed versus a $250 stay per day in a manor, which I did ask Mr. Henderson, Danae Moran, am I being illogical with that, those figures? No, that's an approximately probably accurate. That's $1,000 a day. That's 100 people. That's $100,000 a day. $3 million a month. And we... If you want to solve the problems, get those long-term care people into manors, build bigger manors. What was, <clears throat> I guess the question is, we are, we know it's not rocket scientists to figure out that baby boomers are going to come. The problem is we go in with a four-year plan to get reelected. We don't look at 20 years or 10 years. What you need to do is explain to me when you made the decision to build new facilities and replace them, why did you not increase the number of manor beds knowing full well we were heading in this direction with long-term care? Well, thank, thank Thank you very much, and certainly uh, when we came into government in 07, one of the things, the first thing we did, we lifted the moratorium that was on any additional new beds uh, in the province of Prince Edward Island. Um, yes, uh, we replaced, we spent $68 million replacing, or in the process of finishing off replacing the five public manors here in the province, and uh, uh, they are beautiful facilities. Uh, we, at that time, made a decision that all the new uh, beds that would be added to the system would be added to the private sector and uh, in our first mandate I believe it was approximately uh, 80 new beds that were added to the system and we're responding there will be an announcement this week that we're adding another 60 to 70 more long-term care beds so with that being said uh, we've doubled the home care budget because uh, seniors are saying that they want to be home in the last years of their life they don't want to be in in long-term care facilities we went from a nine million dollar budget to a 20 million dollar budget in five years um, we also um, are looking at uh, ways to continue to f provide interventions to keep seniors in their homes. That's where they want to be. We did not add additional beds in the public sector. Everything is and uh, will continue to go to the private sector um, to uh, operate those beds. So we are adding beds, but we also have to look at, um, at um, the number of long-term care beds we have per capita in the province in comparison to the rest of the jurisdictions. I know that there is... Uh, wait times here. I think there's a, probably a list of approximately 100 uh, seniors in the province. Uh, I know that uh, in larger province it's, um, it's, it's a real issue, but at the same time uh, we are institutionalizing our seniors at a very, very fast rate, and I fundamentally as the minister have a concern with that. I'm very interested in looking at balance between the number of beds we add and also the investments we make in home care to keep seniors in their homes. And we also are looking at supports to look at new creative incentives. We're looking at other provinces, what they're doing to keep seniors at home besides putting them into a long-term care bed. So I'm just, uh, but I appreciate your comment. The 60 beds, there will be an announcement. Uh, there was an RFP done. Uh, basically what we did in our first mandate, uh, a lot of the private operators had space. For example, if you look at Andrews in Summerside, uh, they were given 10 beds, they had room to take 10. Uh, so that's how uh, they were distributed. But uh, right now, uh, any new additions, uh, uh, any new uh, beds went out to an RFP. There's a high volume of interest in the private sector, whether it be uh, Andrews in Summerside or Andrews in Charlottetown or whether it be the Atlantic Baptist. These beds will be announced uh, within the next few weeks. The, apparently the tender has been closed and the beds will be awarded. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. O'Leary uh, has beds that... 
Belfast uh, has beds, O'Leary has beds. I, I don't have the exact numbers right now, but there is beds uh, that have been distributed in, in O'Leary, for example, in, uh, in, in their facility. There's, um, there's beds that have, have been distributed in, at various places across uh, the province. Just before you ask your question, um, there's a couple of things. One is, if you do have a question, just ask me for the mic, because I know that from here, or from here, the minister can hear, but all the other people can't really hear the question, so that would be great. And the other thing is, Minister and, and Richard, I'm wondering if it's possible when you're responding, if you could stand up. Um, because, yeah. because I can see you, but all those yeah. people can't either. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Mike Redmond. I'm the uh, leader of the New Democratic Party of Prince Edward Island. And uh, first of all, I want to uh, say thank you to the community of Alberton for the, for the showing here tonight. And I think it shows what an example uh, and what an important issue healthcare is to the people of Prince Edward Island. A couple points. I will, I will commend you, Mr. Curry, on going to Nova Scotia to see how their healthcare system works over there, because that's, uh, that's an NDP government over there. You should have taken the Minister of Finan Finance with you, and, and they would have been able to show him how to balance the budget. <laughs> Sorry, Wes, it was too easy. A few comments and, and, and a couple questions, if I could. I, I'm a little concerned that, uh, and, and I commend you in doing the, the mental health and addiction uh, uh, study. But I, I think the people of Prince Edward Island deserved a study on health care across the island before you did anything. And I think that's why we're here tonight, because of misinformation. And with misinformation becomes fear-mongering and everything that goes with it. So when you don't allow the people or you don't engage communities, and communities, or, or, or people in Alberton, but also let's talk to the nurses. Let's talk to the frontline staff. These people are, are working for us every day in the healthcare field, and they feel that you've left them out of the process, and I, and I think that has to be revisited. Um, I'm also con thank you. And I understand the comments about an aging population, but this isn't new. Okay, this isn't new. This is your second term as government. This isn't new to the to conservative government before you. We knew we had an aging population. But there's other things that contribute to here. One in four children in this province live in poverty. We have 17,000 people living below the poverty line, right? These are, these are major issues. We have the highest obesity rates in Canada. These are determinants to our health care system. How are we going to ensure that people live with a standard of dignity in life when we're not addressing these fundamental issues in our economy? And we're not an economy. We're a society. So when I think about what's happening on Prince Edward Island, the most important thing and a question that needs to be answered, and it needs to be answered by everybody in the room, is what do we want our society to look like? Are fisheries important? Is farming important? Is tourism important? Because you know what? Those things don't occur in Charlottetown. Right? And one of the things that's not being addressed tonight is the mental health and the anguish that we are, are, are really perpetuating on small communities because we didn't engage. We once again missed an opportunity to speak to the people of Prince Edward Island, to do a proper study and say, where are we going to be in 10 or 20 years' time when the healthcare system dollars are at this level? Okay, so I'm very concerned about that. So I, co I commend you for, for being here tonight and, and taking the questions, but you put the cart before the horse again. And I don't know if that's the government's uh, mandate. And a question that hasn't been answered, and, and you can answer this is my last one, and I, I promise I'll get off the mic. I heard enough of me today. You, you said that the administrative costs that the CD Howe presented were inaccurate. They aren't three times the national average but we never came back and heard what are the actual health administrative costs of Prince Edward Island because those are your first, if you're going to start to cut, don't cut the frontline services, cut your administrative costs and the people sitting behind the desks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do I need a mic? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And you know I'm always open for uh, suggestions and solutions besides uh, some of those comments. So, as you say, you know, it's uh, the answers. And you talk about the, the fiscal reality of the province and the pressures. Well, we do have some fiscal realities. Right now, health care is chewing up 42% of our entire budget, 
And if we do not continue to find ways to contain that growth, it's going to be a fundamental problem here in the province of Prince Edward Island. Now, that's not fear-mongering. That's just uh, the pressures and realities uh, that we're facing. And as a, you know, we're, we're seeing intense growth. Uh, obviously, the mental health and addictions report and review uh, that will roll late in the next few months will give us uh, some more clear direction in respect to that particular area. So certainly a very important area. Um, but uh, lots of challenges. Um, as I said, uh, I'm open for suggestions and solutions in respect to how we move forward. Uh, healthcare is a very, very complex file. I don't think anybody would argue that. And the solutions are not easy. I've been around this uh, business now for a number of years, and um, it's not easy. And to try to look at how we continue to meet the needs of communities, how we respond to the pressures, whether it be the aging population or the high volumes of chronic disease. And you talk about wellness, we'll be uh, rolling out a wellness strategy, but the department is working in communities, particularly in the western part of the province here with GoPEI. A lot of great initiatives going on. Uh, supporting support groups, uh, um, minor support groups as well. So uh, certainly so there's lots of positive going on, but uh, certainly lots of work to do. So. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, who else has a question? Just, just one sec, just one sec. I, I'm just, I just want to make sure that lots of people get a chance. So who does, is there anyone else? Right, okay, go for it. I'm Phyllis Porter. Uh, I'm also on this ER committee as well as the, I, uh, the Island-wide committee. And um, I must say I'm very, very unhappy with what you're doing, <coughs> Minister Curry. You have no concept of how you're hurting these small communities. Uh, they've worked so hard, so hard for each one of their own little hospitals. I know with our hospital, Western Hospital, uh, having worked there for quite a few years and uh, it is certainly very dear to me. Now, I don't like the idea you're blaming everything on us old folks. By God, there's a lot of young old folks today. So don't put all the blame, you know. You'd be surprised how many of us are out there walking and doing our thing. Now, the big concern I have as a nurse is this collaborative care. It scares me. I've uh, spoke with someone in Nova Scotia who is in that collaborative care, did not work with nurse and a paramedic, did not work at all. Now, maybe it will work, I don't know, but there's a lot of concern, a lot of worries. We've been a fully accredited hospital, quality care, and we want to keep what we have. Can you ensure that we're not going to lose any more? You guys have been cutting us to the bone over the years when I think what we've lost, not only Western, but other hospitals as well. You see, at Queen Elizabeth, Prince County, you're all so secure. You've got everything there. We don't really have that much, and we don't want to lose any more. That's all I have to say. Well, thank you. And yes, and I, my mother is a senior, and she reminds me every day that uh, that uh, I shouldn't be talking about the seniors. So, but really, it's 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 about just some of the realities that we're we're facing and and the pressures. And that's not slowing down or going away. But this is really about trying to make sure that we we reevaluate how we're trying to maintain services in communities. And nothing's being closed. Um, we're not sh closing beds. We are trying to make sure that we have acute care services, particularly for individuals who are living in communities all over the province that need that uh, specialty emergency acute service uh, in our two larger facilities, but also making sure that, as I said to my mother, I said, Mom, if you have a, your hip done, you're spending two days at the QEH and you're going to be going to Surrey and we're going to have to go out and you're going to convalesce and restore and spend time in the community. That's the model that we're looking at. We're not driving people out of the communities, we're driving people into them, but we have to protect those acute care beds at our two facilities. I, as the minister, fundamentally cannot sit around and listen to the volume of stories. I get them every day. Seniors that are sitting on stretchers and hallways, uh, children with broken arms waiting for uh, beds, uh, elective surgeries being cancelled. That is part of the realities that, uh, that I experience every day. And we, we have assets in our system and we have to fully deploy those assets. And we also have to make sure that we have fully functioning services and that we can provide good quality service for islanders that need services out of the province of Prince Edward Island. And uh, today we would have six ground ambulances uh, leaving the province at 10 hours a day. 
last year we had 3,300 interprovincial, tra interprovincial transfers from hospital to hospital. So it's just the, the pressures continue to, to rise in respect to how we manage the system. So doing nothing is not an option. And if this was about politics, I wouldn't be doing anything because I'd be more concerned about protecting my job. And that's not what I'm here to do. Uh, I have to do what's in the best interest of health equity from tip to tip for all Islanders. I, I plan to continue to live here. I will retire here and probably will be in a long-term care bed somewhere at some point in time. I have two girls that I would like to see uh, stay in this province. But these changes are an evolution, and I know that governments come in, they close emergency rooms. I was part of that. The former administration had to deal with the emergency room in Surrey, the emergency room in Time Valley. We were delivering babies in O'Leary 30 years ago. The system's evolving, and how do we as government continue to try to meet those pressures and demands, but continue to respond and make sure that we have good access, uh, appropriate services by the appropriate provider in the appropriate situation. So, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. I think this lady, would you like to go there or do you want to use it? Uh, my name is Malvina Darash. I'm from St. Felix, not too far from Tignish. And uh, Honorable Ms. Mr. Curry. Uh, how can we call the new collaborative emergency care a safe 24-hour ER care to residents of West Prince? <coughs> Let me give you an example. If, when, I present myself to our ER with a heart attack, and the RNs are unable to give me the medication called clot, clot Buster, which will dissolve my clot and allow me to have little, if any, damage to my heart. I understand that at the present time, doctors are the only ones allowed to give this medication. Meanwhile, I must travel to Prince County Hospital during my critical hour and as a result, have more damage to my heart muscle, not to mention what heart rhythm I could present to them upon arrival. We deserve equal treatment, whether we live in rural or urban areas. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very good question, and certainly I see uh, some paramedics at the back of the room, and uh, our paramedics, and uh, after some investigation uh, and some meetings with um, Medivive, which oversees Island EMS, I know that in Cape Britain, uh, the CECs have been introduced, and I know that the advanced care paramedics over there now are being trained to uh, administer the thrombolytic needle, I believe it is. I believe that's the technical term. So the advanced care paramedic does have the skill sets and uh, they're being fully deployed in other jurisdictions. So I think uh, as, as a province, we have the responsibility to look at, at uh, healthcare providers and continue to look at the role that they can play to continue to support. Um, right now, we know that we've had uh, interruptions in overnight services. The physicians are choosing not to work uh, in the emergency room here in Western. Uh, so we could continue, if we didn't explore any innovative options, if we didn't look at anything new, we would continue to see cancellations after cancellations because the physicians aren't choosing to work. So we could continue with that model or we could look at ways that uh, are being implemented and being successful in other communities. So that's what we've chosen to do and it's, it's a change from what uh, has traditionally happened. But at least uh, community members will know that overnight they can walk into uh, the emergency room and see the whites of an eye of an RN and an advanced care paramedic who are highly trained and who can triage and consult and engage with the PCH or the QEH in consultation on that emergency. And with the expansion of the rapid response vehicles and our ground ambulance fleet, uh, the golden hour I'm fully well aware of and I'm not a clinician, but certainly uh, everything around emergency response services is built around that golden hour model. So, thank you. Thank you, Malvina. Yes. Uh, Mike Murphy, Mayor of the Town of Alberton. Um, thank you for allowing me time to speak. My council and I have arrived, and I apologize for our lateness. However, we did have other town business which had to be addressed. We are here as a team to, of course, express the interest in the services of Western Hospital. We have always been supportive of the services of Western Hospital. It is unfortunate that comments were made portraying council and myself in a bad light, but I can assure you we are in full support 
of the Western Hospital. Thank you. I just, uh, a comment, uh, Mayor, I had a chat with him today and uh, I knew that they were going to be late because of the council meeting, but I just want to make a comment that uh, the Mayor and Council and I'll, uh, are, have been very engaged in the issue uh, and sharing their concerns with me as Minister and really have done a great job. And uh, I think uh, part of the challenge is, is sort of the, you know, looking at, you know, the direction we're going in, the pressures, um, but uh, in fairness to Council and the Mayor and, and support my colleague Pat, we don't always agree, but uh, they've done a great job advocating and they've made sure that uh, we continue to maintain good quality, accessible, safe services. And I do want to add uh, the comment around uh, uh, discussions back to uh, um, Mike Redmond's comment. There was a survey that was uh, rolled out to 60, 2,000 households uh, across Prince Edward Island over the last year and I believe the response from those um, uh, surveys were around 12,000 Islanders responded to those surveys in respect to feedback. I know that we've done community assessments and surveys in communities, community needs assessments to look at what communities were looking for. So there was a survey done, a lot of good information back and uh, really tied into looking at ways that we can provide better access, looking at ways that we can uh, the, expand the scope of the nurse practitioner. Islanders uh, understand that there is opportunities out there for other types of services. So we are listening to those surveys and we are uh, responding to them. So thanks. Thank you, Mayor. And now it looks like you might want to. Now it looks like you might want to maybe make a line so that we know who's next. Um, okay, and then yeah. This and this lady here, I think I saw her hand up first. Oh, if you don't mind, sorry. okay. You want to just? I'll, I'll stay here. Okay. Uh, my name is Faye Good. I'm a new arrival on the island. Arrived um, in September, and love it here. I did have some major concerns um, about whether I'd be looked after. I'm 72 years old and hope to be well looked after by our health care service. Um, I was very interested in the summary of what was about to happen at Western Hospital. Wondered how long it will take for this system to be implemented, or implemented rather. Um, for instance, when will uh, the rapid response unit be up and running in the community. How early can we expect to call 811 and have someone to speak with? Is it going to be six months? Is it going to be two years? Uh, is there going to be another election before any of it even happens? Or are we going to be struggling with this in four or five years' time? Thank you. Yeah, just Thank you for those questions and uh, obviously the 811 we're looking at uh, rolling it out by September 1, fully functioned, fully operational. Rapid response vehicles uh, at the very latest uh, within the next uh, six to eight weeks. Um, the uh, Collaborative Emergency Room Centre, obviously there's, a, there's the discussions are on, we're, we're meeting with Matt Crossman and Island EMS. Uh, and as I said, these are models and these are implementations of healthcare strategies that are already functioning and working. We're not uh, reinventing the wheel. So uh, the expectation from my, myself as minister is that we're, we're very actively engaged and uh, we're up and running as soon as possible. Um, my name is Kathy Elward. Um, <clears throat> my question is, it, it's, it's a question and it's an expression of frustration. It just really, really seems, I mean, <coughs> is this set in stone? Because if it is the word collaborative, you know, is, is being very loosely used, if you ask me. I mean, we've got dirt piles in Borden that cost millions of dollars. We've got loans that are being wiped out for $8 million. You ask us about the HST, we say, no, no, don't want it. Well, you're getting it anyway. You ask us about changes to DEI. All these things, it seems, are people are making decisions although we're telling you what we don't want. So <clears throat> I feel like a five-year-old has been spanked by my dad who's sitting there saying, this is hurting me more than it's hurting you. Because we really feel like we have absolutely no say in, in what's happening with our government and the huge decisions you people are making. 
So the question is, is this an information session or do we have an opportunity to contribute? Thanks. Um, I guess I'll respond to the part around collaborative emergency centers. This is a name that uh, was developed in Nova Scotia, but the collaboration is, is not the sort of uh, community discussion that's happening now. The collaboration that's referred to in a collaborative emergency center is the nurse, the paramedic, and the uh, on-call physician who collaborate to try and decide what's the best uh, disposition for the patient that's in front of them. That, that's where that word comes from for, for that particular. Yes, sir, you, go. you can go now, and then I have someone back here as well. Yeah. Go for it. You? He's yep. done? Okay. Hi. Uh, my, heh, they're, they're saying answer that question that was asked before. Set in stone? Set in stone, or is this set in stone, I guess? Is. Well, we have conversation. well, basically, you know, obviously what, what we shared tonight is basically a system that's not functioning and working. So we've got two options, really. We either continue with the status quo, which we know is not working, there's high levels of frustrations, or we look at new ways to try to uh, sustain what we have and protect what we have. So those are my options as the minister here in the province. And, you know, I could sit and say, well, we're not doing anything. Uh, we're going to continue to try to recruit doctors and try to get them into the emergency room. Uh, they're just going to say they're not going to work in the emergency rooms overnight, and then we're looking to be forced at closures. So we get two options. We can look at... Uh, um, maintaining the status quo and do nothing, or we can, we can embrace uh, new opportunities and try to continue to use our facilities to their full potential. So that's really what, uh, what this is about tonight, using our assets and protecting what we have to make sure that we have a system that's functioning and working for all patients across Prince Edward Island. Um, hi, my name is uh, Rod McNeil. I'm from Tyne Valley, and I'm co-chair of the uh, Friends of the Stewart Memorial Hospital, soon to have to have a name change to a manor. Um, I didn't want to take up much time here tonight because this is, this is Alberton's and the, this part of, to ask their specific questions. We have a lot of very, very major concerns about this overall plan, especially when our facility is being completely tur turned into a manor and I would note that at no place on your presentation did you use that word from Tyne Valley Hospital or Community Health Center or Stuart Miller Health Center to Manor. I think you understand that that's a pretty big move. I also would caution that we've worked along as in a group for 10 years. We've made many, many changes, and I think probably the message we learned, we should have drawn the line in the sand a few years ago, because look where we are now. Our facility has gone from a hospital, and we are going to be a manor if this is implemented. And the other, the part that I, that's, um, as I said, we'll, we'll deal with some of those issues next Monday at our meeting. Um, but one of the things that I see about this plan, and even tonight when I go through your numbers, things seem to be flawed in the math. Um, Pam spoke to that earlier. But even so, the number that I've been told that we're stuck in our acute care beds across the province were 110. I heard last week 80. Tonight on these it says 37. And then this is supposed to be the reason if it was 80, we're only gaining maybe 15 or 20 beds from the acute care from Surrey and Tyne Valley and O'Leary. So how do you put 80 people in 20 beds so you haven't cured the short-term problem you're also on record saying it's not going to save you any money, but then I hear you're going to make an announcement next week that there's going to be 80 more acute care beds, uh, not acute care beds, a long-term beds become available in the province. Everything keeps changing. We don't get the big picture ever. Uh, we don't see the where you're going to get any improvements. We're still going to have the same problems. And also, the biggest thing, the biggest thing that I noticed in this thing is that it seems to be a message that the people that are in rural PEI hospitals that are in acute care beds don't deserve to be in those beds. 
they're not sick enough. Because if we take them from the rural areas and put them in Summerside and Charlottetown, what have we accomplished? So it must be they're not sick enough to be in the hospitals. Anyway, that's, it's mostly comments. We'll have lots of questions for you next Monday, and I don't want to take up any more time. This is Alberton and the, the, the further, but I just caution everybody, doesn't stop just at these items. It just keeps going and going and going. And I believe that we're cannibalizing the system. And I, I appreciate the gentleman at the front. We've got a major problem with health care, not only in PEI, but in Canada. Even that math doesn't add up. 11% growth in five years, if your numbers are correct. I didn't know that. I thought it was seven. This year, the budget is 2.9% allowed for growth. That's 7% less. Boy, there's going to be a lot of cannibalization on the bottom end. And I just don't know. I don't have the answers either, uh, Mr. Minister, but I don't think this is make getting you any headway. No. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. We, we certainly, you and I had this discussion, I uh, just want to clarify, we're talking average growth in the healthcare system for the last seven, eight years at about five and a half, six percent per year, not 11 percent. So that's... Uh, 570 million this year. Yeah. You mentioned earlier tonight, five years ago, 350 million. 360. Okay. Do the math. Is that 6% or closer to 11? No, I, don't, I don't have... Uh, but it's a huge difference. Yeah. Rod, you and I had this discussion last week. We had a good discussion and a good debate, and I know that, uh, you know, your position. And we certainly know some of the challenges uh, in Time Valley. Obviously, we were fortunate to have a, 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 a million-dollar facility uh, in the community, the, well, 800,000, 900,000, uh, the community health center. Okay, doctor's offices. But anyways, at the end of the day, we'll look forward to the discussion in Time Valley. I mean, and we can, we can continue to crunch the number and roll it out in respect to the growth. And really what I'm talking about, it's not that I'm here spitting out numbers that I want to be spitting out. It's just, just I'm communicating to the public. These are some of the pressures and realities that we're facing. Uh, this is an issue that every jurisdiction in the country, in Nova Scotia, their health authorities are, were given a minus three this year. Uh, New Brunswick health authorities, I believe, are at a zero. We continue to spend in health care. This budget, we're at about 3%. Last year, we were at 4.1% to increase in spending. I think we came in at around 5% which was probably the fourth largest healthcare spend in the country. So just some of the pressures and some of the realities, and if money wasn't an issue and wasn't a problem, we wouldn't have to be sitting here and changing or evolving anything here in the province. You're a very successful businessman, Rod, and I respect you, and you know numbers and you know how to run operations. So thank you very much. Yes. My name is Leo Trainer. I live in Piusville. Glad that I came here tonight, but I have a heavy heart, and I have a heavy heart for a couple of reasons. We're talking about dollars and cents, and we're not dealing with people. It's people that we need to concentrate on. And two things are very close to me in our medical system. Unfortunately, we do not have sufficient coverage to deal with our cancer patients. That one has to be addressed. I don't know if you're going to announce someone coming, but uh, there's not a person in this room that's not affected by someone that they know and love and care who has cancer. Dollars and cents, we have to get beyond that. Secondly, one very dear to me is the addition, ad, uh, issue of addiction. I'm a recovering alcoholic. If I did not find the program almost 24 years ago, over 24 years ago, I wouldn't be standing here. In the 90s, with Dr. Sheldon Cameron and a bunch of other very concerned people, we went across this province trying to fight for addictions. But the decision was made, and Mount Herbert got it. And if you're living in Nail Pond and you've got to get someone in Mount Herbert, that's a hell of a long drive with a drunk. <laughs> the 
The other thing that concerns me is the addiction issue on the island in West Prince and all that that affects. Do we really know how serious that is of an issue? Kids in junior high, it's not alcohol, it's drugs, the mixing, and it's getting worse. And our young people have to go west. And as a friend of mine in the program of AA said, the good ones go and make the money, and those who can't pass the drug tests are home, and we have to look after them. They're diseases. They're not bad people. An addiction is an addiction. It's a disease. We're talking about the old people. I've told my wife I will be in the Margaret Ellis rooms probably in a couple of years. That's just my health issues. I can't change that. But I'm really concerned for my stepchildren, young girls. What are they going to have? I've been well served at this hospital, in O'Leary Hospital, and in every hospital in this island. But, as the minister has said, we are in very serious trouble. This is not to be a political issue. This is to be human rights. Dignity for every person, child, adult, family, people. Serious. I wish you well. You got your hands tied. First place, clean out the Shaw building. Thanks, Leo, for obviously, I know Leo's a big hockey fan and you see him around the rinks and so on, but uh, certainly, obviously, the mental health and addictions piece is, uh, is a growing real issue in communities across Prince Rhode Island. We embarked, as I indicated earlier, to a uh, question around uh, our response to the mental health and addictions review. And uh, mental health and addictions here in the province, uh, the acute system tends to get all the focus and attention uh, because it's, it's where we spend. But he also acknowledged the oncology unit at the Cancer Treatment Center. We have islanders every day coming in there. Uh, that one keeps me up at night uh, to try to recruit two oncologists here in the province. Prince Island is a very specialized area. But uh, we're, we're continuing to move towards that. And I really appreciate Leo's comments. This discussion, healthcare really, we, we, the politicians need to be completely out of this discussion altogether. And this can't be a political issue because healthcare must transcend politics. There's too much at stake. Uh, and uh, really this is about trying to improve access. Obviously the system's not functioning and working. We recognize that, we see that. Um, but, you know, we have the focus on community, then as the minister I look at community, then I talk to people in board, and it takes them 40 minutes to get any access, or 35 minutes. I go to Stanley Bridge, takes them 35 minutes for any level of health care. So I'm trying to look at health care from, from an equity perspective. There's, there's, there's a volume of money we have. Uh, we increased physician salaries in this province from 07 from $62 million to $105 million. Um, these are just realities, and we talk about recruitment and trying to retain physicians. Well, we got to pay our physicians, so that's just a snapshot from 62 million to 105 million for 225 physicians. That's the salaries that we pay here in the province, and uh, this is a very serious discussion about the future of this province and the sustainability and viability of communities. And as I said, this is about driving people out to communities, not only driving people into Charlottetown. So I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marlene Bulger. I'm retired administrator at Western Hospital. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I do commend you on the 811 system. I think that's been a long time coming and very much needed. And the transfer vehicle, that will take some of the uh, pressure off the ambulance system. The rapid response unit sounds good, but I understand there's only going to be two in the province, and the one for the west will be between Hunter River and North Cape. And rapid... <laughs> Unless it's going to spread wings, I don't know how much value it's going to be for somebody who's having a heart attack or having a major car accident in West Prince. Because, you know, it takes an hour and 30, about an hour and three quarters to get from Hunter River 
to North Cape. And I would hope by then at least there'd be an ambulance in place. Uh, the rapid response isn't going to be much good. If you can tell me it's going to be in West Prince, then maybe there will be some value to that unit. But if it's for all of that area, I don't see what value it will be. Um, I mainly want to ask, though, about the CE centers and the staffing. Um, I've heard from both of you, gentlemen, and also in the media, uh, a wide range of staffing for the CECs, everything from two RNs um, to a nurse practitioner and a paramedic, advanced practice paramedic. And if people don't know what the scope of practice for those different individuals are, it'd be worth looking into it. There's a huge difference in what a nurse can do. And nurses are wonderful. They have wonderful skills. But their scope of practice is very limited when it comes to emergency on their own. They can't diagnose. They can't prescribe medication. They can't order tests. They can't admit. Um, <clears throat> paramedic 3, or advanced practice paramedic, can do a lot of procedures. You, somebody asked about the thrombolytics. Um, a nurse practitioner, there's a lot of things that they can do that an RN, it's not within their scope of practice. They may have the skill, but it's not within the scope of practice. So there's going to be a huge difference for if I'm, I'm coming to the emergency department at 10 o'clock at night um, in a heart attack or whatever it might be, uh, the care that I'm going to get is going to be widely impacted by um, the person that's going to be meeting me at the door. So I would like to know, I'd like to have some assurance that if we went with the CEC model, that we would have advanced practice paramedics and nurse practitioners on site. Not, and I don't mean this negatively on nurses, because they're wonderful, but just a nurse in the ER is not going to meet our needs. And finally, um, can we be assured if this model comes into place that that is going to be the end of it? That there will be no further cuts, cutbacks, um, are, and how are you going to be able to staff a CEC center with the level of um, people that, I've, that I would like to see? Um, the paramedics are, right now they're all employed by, they're all employed privately. Are they going to be hired in the health system? Are they going to be contracted through um, EMS? Um, has it been worked out if that is the case? Uh, has it been worked out with unions that they're going to be allowed to, to practice in the ERs? Um, there's a lot of those questions that I think we need to be very, very clear on before we can put any um, assurance into this system. And finally, I'd like to know, um, when I look at the Sanchez report, it just seems like you've just been ticking off the boxes. And is this just one more tick in the box? And how much, how much farther are you going to go into that report? Because there's a lot more to come, if that's the yeah. case. Thanks, Marlene. Great questions. Certainly, the model, obviously, in the CEC would be uh, an RN and, obviously, an advanced care paramedic. Uh, that's the focus right now. Uh, obviously, you know, there's discussions about uh, nurse practitioners, but, you know, the reality, we have nurses, uh, and I believe some of the nurses that were on the tour with us, um, got an appreciation for the role of the the nurse in the CEC in Spring Hill. So we need, the focus is stabilizing and getting health professionals in there that are highly trained and qualified to meet the needs uh, of individuals coming through the door at any time overnight. Um, in respect to the Sanchez report, the Sanchez report, I don't think I've picked it up since uh, I've come back uh, in as Minister of Health. That was a report that was given to government. Uh, we basically, it was a, uh, parts of that were a made in PEI. Uh, there's, there's recommendations in that report that government is certainly not gonna touch or has no interest in touching. And uh, yeah, I hope this will be the last public meeting I have to come to Alberton, okay? So I'll be frank with that. Uh, this is not fun work. And, but at the same time, I'm under uh, some pressure to respond to a system, to look at improving access and getting into, uh, getting islanders into healthcare facilities to meet healthcare providers. It is a little territorial at times because you get into discussions with unions around nurses, uh, LPNs. Um, I know that when we were come in in 07, we expanded the scope of LPNs in the, in the system. Uh, they embraced it. Uh, other health professionals weren't real happy about that. Then the doctors get a little territorial as well, but at the end of the day, my focus is on 
the best access for, for patients in, in communities across Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Marlene. And so uh, I just, just before you start, it's just 10 to 9 now. So we have time for one more question after yours. I just want to point out as well, the, the rapid response unit is going to be based in West Prince, somewhere north of Portage. There, there's no rapid, it's not from Hunter River to West Prince, it's Portage to Tignish. So it's going to be deployed based on uh, where the ambulances are being deployed at the time, maybe in the Alberton areas, maybe in the Tignish area, maybe in the uh, Wallery area. So it's, it's not, uh, it, it is belonging to West Prince. My name is Maxine Barber. I actually have a quick question uh, as well as a quick comment. Um, one, um, I have a quick question to ask. We've built beautiful new manors. However, we're heating, at least in Alberton, the old manor, which is costing quite a lot of money to heat. Why is this still occurring? Why are these buildings still being maintained and that our healthcare money being used to heat these buildings? Another point, I have returned to PEI from Ontario. I grew up here before. I returned uh, three and a half years ago. I have been on the registry for um, the healthcare registry for both West Prince, Summerside, and Charlottetown, and I still haven't received a family physician in three and a half years. And telehealth, we had in Ontario for 15 years. All it did was increase the volume in our ERs by 20 or 30%. Good evening. My name is Mona O'Shea and I am actually the president of the PI Nurses Union and I just have a comment to make. Um, one is that I'm not here to debate what services you can or cannot provide. It's not my role. Uh, the second uh, comment that I'd like to make is that I will not stand here and tell you what services or who will be the professionals in the ER departments. That will be in consultation uh, with the union and hopefully you, uh, Minister Curry and Dr. Wedge. So I um, ask for the opportunity to be consulted and join you in discussion about the roles of uh, what the RN will play in the emergency department because I do uh, have a lot of uh, registered nurses here in the crowd that are very fearful of what that's going to look like. So I open the opportunity and would like the opportunity to have the discussion with you. Thank you. My name is Michelle Arsenault and I am a concerned citizen in West Prince. Um, I have some questions regarding some of the uh, outlines that I've seen with better access and better care. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that we have some really fine paramedics in PEI and I would trust any of them with my life and hopefully I never have to. Um, in your proposed plan, for better access, better care. Uh, the ambulance service seems to be a key, uh, a key part. Does uh, the minister and PEI Health consider ambulance service to be a crucial part of rural health care? Um, I'd say yes. Um, obviously, the the role of the ground ambulance fleet here in the province was brought in, I believe, in 06 by the former administration. I see that as um, an investment into emergency response services with highly trained paramedics across the province that, um, that uh, with the, the technology and the vehicles and the training they have uh, can play um, um, a strong asset in uh, emergency responses. Okay. Um my response to that is that uh, Tommy Douglas, the father of modern Medicare in Canada, said that the first phase of Medicare was to remove financial barriers between those giving the service and those receiving it. Currently, Islanders are charged a $150 fee for the use of an essential, uh, a, you admitted, an essential health care service. Many Islanders are in collections and have had credit ruined because of unforeseen ambulance bills. Many Islanders struggle to make ends meet and live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, Two-tier healthcare is defined as a healthcare system where everyone can access a basic publicly funded healthcare program, but for those who afford it, can access a more robust level of healthcare with better and faster access. On Health Canada's Guide to Understanding Medicare in Canada, 
under services covered by provincial health care plans, it states that ambulatory services are to be provided for those unable to transport themselves to a hospital in the event of an emergency. So to clarify, Island EMS is a privately owned company and by the minister's own admission it plays a crucial role in rural health care delivery. Therefore, will the minister commit to covering all ambulance fees for Islanders, which both he and the Canada Health Act define as an essential service, thereby removing a two-tiered system currently in place and removing barriers to public health care? Thank you. And uh, really what, what tonight's about is protecting publicly funded health care. And uh, we must remember that uh, publicly funded health care was introduced by Tommy Douglas in the late 50s. And at that time was funded uh, by 50 cent dollars from the federal government. And in all fairness to the current federal government, because of former federal governments in the past, we are currently at around 19 cents on every dollar spent in health care. Because now it's a transfer payment from the federal government they have basically disengaged on any conversation uh, on the 2014 Health Accord. Uh, so uh, that's where we're currently at. Um, I can't commit uh, to you tonight that uh, I believe that we've, we've made some inroads in reducing the pressures on the cost of ground ambulance services to, to Islanders, particularly with our seniors, uh, and Etta Province uh, transfers, particularly um, um, air, airlift uh, uh, flights and so on so but a good question uh, and if opposition is still here they could probably copy that down and test me in the ledge in that one so thank you um, about five people ago I said we'd take one more question so I'm, I'm going to please ask you that excuse me excuse me and, and I'm just going to say so the people that are standing right now maybe you'll be the last questions then okay thank you uh, Minister Curry and Dr. Widge. Uh, I'm Brenda Pitt and I work at the Western. I'm just going to say a short se few sentences. Um, we do realize that there's many doctors uh, that are coming out of med school and want to do maybe family physician or, or surgeon or whatever. But we do have physicians that want to do ER only. Uh, We've heard different times that this new system, this new collaborative emergency care system, is not going to save the province any money. Why not pay our doc the doctors that do want to do our ER on a 24-hour basis, pay them equally to their neighboring doctors? I know we don't have the same amount of patients as what Prince County would have. But I also don't feel that they can handle everything from Tyne Valley up to North Cape. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the question is, is correct. If the physicians do are interested in working uh, in the practices. Some of them are interested in doing emergency room uh, work, but in general, most people are not interested in doing emergency room um, when they first are, are freshly trained in Canada. Mm -hmm. There are some, in, in fairness, who, who are interested in doing that. I, I think part of the problem, though, uh, with Western Hospital is the amount of uh, patients who have that true emergency uh, as you can see in the slide, even during the day, the, those numbers aren't particularly high. You have to have a critical mass of patients to maintain those skills. So unless they're going to float between a number of different hospitals, they're not going to maintain those skills is, a, is the main problem. Hi, my name is Stephanie Goody, and as registered nurses of Western Hospital, um, Mr. Curry, I have a question for you. You said earlier this evening that you'll be working with Matt Crosman and Island EMS in collaboration. Are you willing to work with the frontline registered nurses who will be affected by the CEC model? <clears throat>
to that would be yes. And obviously, um, I know Jamie McDonald's here tonight, uh, who um, is with Health PEI, and I've had numerous conversations. Obviously, when we're introducing a model of delivery that's that's new, obviously we want to make sure that the the providers, particularly the nurses, the paramedics, uh, really clearly understand the model. Um, and um, in consultations with the Cumberland uh, Health Authority, they're very much uh, very interested in looking at making sure that the transition and the implementation of the model is successful. Um, we didn't uh, want to focus on CEC in another jurisdiction at this point in time. We wanted to solely focus on Western to make sure that we, we provide uh, um, obviously a process for implementation and the key is to stabilize services uh, in the hospital and to make sure that obviously uh, if it's going to be successful, nurses that are working there obviously will have to be engaged in there because there will be a, a level of responsibility and a role. Obviously with the CEC, there's a high level of engagement with uh, emergency room physicians depending on the, uh, the assessment or the level of acuity coming in uh, with um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital or the um, uh, Prince County Hospital. So the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all your questions and all your comments. Um, and I was just going to say, Minister, do you, do you want to have a few closing words? Well, I just want to, to wrap up by saying, that first of all, I, I appreciate everyone coming out. And I, I recognize that uh, when we look at uh, shifting uh, cultures and change, it's difficult. But uh, as the Minister, um, you know, my role is sort of the overarching system. Uh, responsible for 570 million dollars and it's really about trying to stabilize and provide good access at the appropriate time in the appropriate situation by the appropriate provider and whether you're looking for a hip in Charlottetown or you're being transferred to Surrey uh, after your hip uh, these are some of the realities that uh, our province will be engaging and facing as a result of some of the uh, the pressures that we're under and um, these are not easy decisions. These are, these are difficult decisions. Um, this is tough politics, but good public health policy for the future. And uh, if we're spending money on health care, we want to make sure it's about the patient and we're getting the best value and outcomes we can for that individual, irregardless if they're living in Borden, Alberton, Surrey, Tignish, Charlottetown, or Summerside. So thank you for coming out tonight and great questions. Thanks.